activity for you. There, I'm on. Woo. It's a, you guys are going to be jealous because it's a word search that's foot washing. And it's got, they have to find the words basin, disciple, dried, all these things. Because if you don't know what this is, the day that Jesus came into Jerusalem, isn't it? It's Palm Sunday. Have you thought about the things that went on 2,000 years ago this week? Part of what we are going to do Thursday night is we're going to do a Lord's Supper. It's at 6.30. What we're going to be doing then is we're going to set up tables where we recline. Yeah, you're going to have to get down on the ground and we're going to get each other back up if we need to, if we need help. And we're going to have a meal like Jesus had that day and think about what He shared with those disciples as He was giving that last loving instructions for them because the very next day He's going to head to Calvary, right? Good Friday. But... We have a wonderful thing to look forward to on Easter Sunday, right? An empty tomb that no other religious group can say. But we can say that our Savior is risen and He's at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. Wow. So let's start in prayer. Father, we do thank You and praise You that You are so awesome and so good. That You would choose to love us. That You would choose to love us even in spite of our sin and shame. And that you would send your son to die for us. That that's your plan. That he would be born a man and he would live a sinless life. And he would take our pain, our shame upon him to set us free. And not just set us free, but that we could become your very own children. Lord, just help us to think about the things that you have done for us. And the power that is in us with the spirit that you have given us. That that lets us proclaim out, Father, Father. We just praise your holy name today. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. So on Thursday night, that's what we're doing. On Friday night, there is a community worship service at Becker Auditorium at 7 o'clock where we'll be going over the Stations of the Cross so you can think about what Jesus did that day and the things that, that He was feeling and seeing that day when He actually went to Calvary and laid down His life for us. If you look in your bulletins, i got some cartoons in there. I did cartoons a lot this week. And there's a couple of sheep on the side that says, For I gave you an example that you should do as I do. And that's from John 13, 15, which we just went over today. And that's part of what we'll do Thursday night. So if you come prepared, guess what? We're probably going to wash each other's feet. It's a humbling experience, but it's something that Jesus set that example so that we would know how to serve others, that we would know that He purchased our life back from sin and shame to be used for God's glory and honor. And then I like the one I put on the other side. It says, this is impossible. The other sheep says, what? Love one another as I have loved you. Yet Jesus' extravagant love knows no limits. Well, there's got to be a loophole in here for dealing with jerks. But there's not, is it? That's why I put right below it, as I have loved you, love one another. And then the BC comic that's there says, I hate the term Good Friday. He says, why? My Lord was hanged on a tree that day. He says, if you were going to be hanged on that day and he volunteered to take your place, how would you feel? Good. <laughs> he says, have a nice day. Point's kind of made, right? Easter is one week away. We celebrate and we will be having our sunrise service at 6 a.m., not 6.30, because I went out the other day and looked and at 6.30 it's light. I want to see it transition from light today. So we need to be out there by 6 o'clock so that we can see that. Who knows, we may even get to see the sun come over the mountains, but we will see a transition of light to dark, like that first Easter day when the women went out still at dark and found that empty tomb where Jesus was risen from the dead just as He proclaimed. So, Sunday He arose. We're going to celebrate. But let's talk a little bit about what happened prior to that. The last night of Jesus' life, He longed to spend with those that were closest to Him. Those that Scripture says He loved until the very end. And He not only talked with them, He not only spoke with them and shared with them, but He set an example for them that day. He washed their feet. And we don't think as much about that because we wear shoes and everything. But the disciples wore sandals or went bare feet. And the road scum, which the cattle and donkeys and sheep and everything carried down the same road, that's what they walked in. They walked in the muck and the mire and even the dung. 
And that was a job that no one wanted to do. That's why the disciples hadn't had their feet washed when they went to take part of the meal. Because there wasn't a servant there. There wasn't someone lowly enough to take on this task. And I'm not about to do it. He's not about to do it. We're not about to do it. And Jesus says, I'm going to do it for you. That's why I came. To lay down my life because you don't deserve any of this. But God is offering you mercy and grace instead. And the example that I have set forth to you today, that is how you're supposed to live your life for the world so that other people will know about God, His love, and what Jesus did for them. So we're going to be looking at John today, not Luke. We'll get back to Luke. But we're going to start with John 12, verse 44. It says, Then Jesus cried out. Well, why is He crying out? He's crying out because this is His last chance to spend time with those closest to Him, those who are going to carry on what they've been learning. He is their rabbi. He is their teacher. He's their master, their Lord. They signed up to give up all of their rights to follow after Him, to learn His teachings so that they could carry on those teachings, so that they could behave and live as the master and teach His principles. But if you'll notice, there's... Only 12 of them following, and there's only 11 in fact, right? Because Jesus knows the heart. There are more there in the room, probably. But there are 12 that the foundation of the whole growth of the Christian church is based on. What a ludicrous plan, right? That 12 men are going to start the growth of the church being opposed against the world unto death, and 12 men are going to carry out this task? But 12 men aren't tearing, carrying out this task, are they? God is carrying out this task through 12 men. The power of the Spirit is what changes these guys into mighty warriors for God, even unto death. So He's given them their instructions because He's going to lay down His life tomorrow. He's going to be an atoning sacrifice for the sin of the world. But what does that mean? What does atonement mean? It's a message that's all throughout the Bible. It's a central message all throughout the Bible that God loves us, that He chose to create us, and we rebelled against Him. And the penalty for that is eternal death and separation from God. Who are we to sin against the one who commands mighty army angels, who has the power to create life, stars, things beyond our comprehension, to be in control of the spiritual realm which we can't even see and comprehend? Who are we to sin against God? But instead of snuffing us out, He says, I love you. I love you. I love you even more. I love you so much that the only way that, that can, this can be made right is your life, the life essence, your blood required. The Old Testament tells it it's a blood sacrifice that is required. But as man, we need a man sacrifice. So God became flesh and blood so that He could lay down His life for us. Wow, the story of Easter you got to tell somebody about it. You can't be quiet about it. You've got to tell them what Jesus Christ did for you. You've got the perfect example. The perfect example is out there all of your life to witness. We just don't look for it. We get sidetracked with the things in this world. We get ashamed, distracted, whatever it might be. Last night we went, or yesterday afternoon, we went to see um, the Case for Christ. You all need to go see that movie because you need to promote it so that it will stay at the theater so that people will see it. If you're not familiar, Lee Strobal was an investigative reporter for the Chicago Tribune. He got married. His wife and, them were looking, his wife and him were looking at the world and how they were going to partake it. We're going to get a little house. We're going to raise our family. This is the thing. God was not a part of that life. And then she got saved. She got all Jesus freak on him. And he didn't want any part of it because he lost his wife to Jesus. He felt betrayed. So he went out for two years and sought facts to find out how he could disprove the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He didn't try to disprove that he was a man. He already knew that and everything. People that say that Jesus Christ didn't, didn't ever live don't even look at history. But he said, if I can disprove the resurrection, then it's just like every other religion and we have a faith that's built on sinking sands rather than on the solid rock. And for two years he investigated and all he found was proof that Jesus did exactly what Jesus said and that he was the Son of God. But that's not evidence enough to make somebody to believe because if we don't want to search for the truth, we'll always find every reason to avoid the truth. 
But what changed his life was that his wife continued to pray for him. His wife continued to love him. Even when he became mean and abusive, she just continued to love him. So what made him make a decision for Christ, and, and he's a pastor now and wrote countless number of books and everything else, was that his wife continued to love him. The testimony of a changed life. A Christian. The light of the world. Do you see the influence that we can have on others? No fact was going to prove to him that God existed and that God loved him. But he saw that changed life of his wife. That's the testimony that we carry. And that's what Jesus was trying to tell his disciples this day. Do as I have done for you. I'll do the lowliest job there is to show you how much I love you. And guess what? You're going to find out even more tomorrow how much I love you. Because I'm going to lay down my life for you. And it will cover all sin, all shame. And, and re unite you with the love of your Father in heaven. So atonement is a wonderful thing, and only Jesus could do that. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He attests to it in Scripture that He is that sacrificial lamb that would lay down His life for the world. He gave His life as a ransom for many. And what do we have to do? We have to accept and believe it. And if we do accept and believe it, then our life should surely show it. We should be a changed life that draws others to Jesus Christ. I heard an interview the other day on Moody and one of the first ladies that called in said that she had been married for 38 years faithful to her husband before he came to Christ. And then he died shortly after. He came to Christ because of her love and testimony that the husband was able to see God through his people for their obedience, their love. Jesus said this in Mark 10, 45, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, God Himself, but He came to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. Matthew 10, 28 says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. As we get into the passage in John, it's, it's just... Jesus has told him again that he's going to die. It's just before he is going to the cross the very next day. And he's laying out those final instructions of love. If you've understood any of the miracles, if you've understood any of the parables, teachings that I've told you, this is what it all amounts to, a life of service. Because if a Christian doesn't live that life, then you're not drawing others to Jesus. You're not for Jesus. You're against Jesus. And you're scattering. Matthew 20, verses 26 through 28, to read a little bit more of that section. It says, Not so with you. It's not supposed to be that way. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. So you can't say that was just God's calling and mission for Jesus. It was our mission as His followers to do the same, to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, to follow His teachings. And the world's souls are dependent upon that. Yes, someone else will do it if you don't, but God has called each and every one of us to be a light to the world. And I would hate so much for you guys to miss out and see that. And when you do see that, you'll see the joys, just like these two women that I gave you the examples. They saw their husbands come to Christ. 38 years or two years, it doesn't matter. They saw them, and, and we don't know what's going to happen. We don't have the sovereignty of God. We didn't hang the stars in the sky, but God did. And He has called us to be obedient Christians, to live as Christ lived. That's our purpose and our calling. <clears throat> Jesus tells His disciples in Matthew 26, verses 26 through 28, While they were eating, Jesus took bread. When He get when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of, my, of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. See, nothing can break that covenant that God made with us through Jesus Christ. He accomplished it. He said on the cross, it is finished. 
He accomplished what God set him out to do. And now he's interceding at the right hand of the Father. And he sent the Spirit back. He told the Father to send the Spirit back so that the Spirit is interceding with our spirit that we are the sons of God. There's no power or principality, life or death, that can stand between us and God's love as long as we accept and believe in Jesus Christ. Wow. That's what Easter's all about. But we are supposed to follow the example of the sacrificial lamb, aren't we? Even though justification comes upon believing, it is God's will that we be sanctified. So if we truly believe, our life should show it. Our light should shine brightly. We shouldn't hide it under a bushel. No! Right? We should pull it out and let this light shine. If that light's not shining, then I'm not trying to get you to doubt but you need to sit down with God and say, what do I need to do to let my light shine? I've believed in Jesus. Father, forgive me for not letting my light shine the way it should. And guess what? He'll forgive you. It's a wonderful thing. Believing is enough. Don't ever think and say that I'm saying any different. But if you believe, your life should show it. That's what true believing is. I'll give you an example. If I were your boss and you were my employee, sorry about hitting that, and I gave you an instruction manual, right? And in that instruction manual it said you got to be to work and working by 8 o'clock. And you read that manual, you signed that manual, and you said, I believe this manual, right? But you continue to come in at 8.05, 8.30, quarter to 9, 8.15. Oh, 8 o'clock one day. Do you really believe what you said you believed? You don't show it. You're not following my commands, my orders, my, my will, whatever it is. I was clear in my instructions. I said, if you want to be my employee, then we start work at 8 o'clock. Right? Yeah. Now, you might think you believe it. Your actions don't really show it. But here's what's important. What does your boss believe? I can tell you what I would believe. I would believe you didn't believe what you said you believe. Right? And at some point, you might even get fired. If we're Christians, we should live like Christ. And the world is depending on that. And we were created and designed to bring glory and honor to God. That's why Jesus sets this example today. In 1 John 4.10, it says, This is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. Great are you, Lord. We can mumble up a song or whatever, but we're singing praise to God Almighty for who He is and what He's done through Christ Jesus our Lord. He hears. He knows our hearts. It doesn't matter if our voice is cracking or we stumble on our words or anything else. It matters that our hearts are singing out to Him. So do you love Him? 1 John 14, verses 15 through 21. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. Not in just this lifetime, but in heaven forevermore. The Spirit of truth, the very Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. The world cannot accept Him because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. But you know Him. For He lives with you and will be with you. Every single person that believes, Jesus said, is born again. They are born, of anew, uh, born anew. The Spirit of God lives inside of them. Verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. On that day you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. He's clear. If you don't understand the gospel, read through. Read any gospel and read Jesus' words. If you are my disciple, you will follow after me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Jesus says these words just before He's leaving. So I entitled this sermon, Before I Go, there's a few more things that I want to tell you because I love you so much. I'm going to lay my life down tomorrow and I want to set forth this example to you so you can understand this because this is the most humiliating job you know of in the world today is washing the dung off someone else's feet. 
And I'm going to do that so that you understand this. God, the one that you've put your faith in, who is here now, this promised Messiah that you say that you believe, will wash your nasty feet. Wow. What a statement. So before I go in John 12, 44, Jesus cried out. That's what He's doing because there are plenty of people that have followed after Him. Crowds. We know there were 13,000 people roughly when he, when he fed them on the mountainside. But they only wanted, we read in John 6, 66, they only wanted what He could offer them. They didn't want to serve Him as their God, their Lord, their Master. They wanted what they could get out of the relationship. They weren't genuine. We understand and read what the Pharisees were doing and the scribes of the law. They were hypocrites wearing masks. And Jesus is saying, do you truly believe? Do you want the, the miracles that I can offer you or do you want to see that the miracles are proof of who that I say I am? And I say, if you love me, keep my commands. Do you want to say you're the Pharisees and you do everything right, you live according to the law, but your hearts are far from it? Or do you want to serve me out of a true heart rather than serve me out of obligation or, or whatever the motive is for you? So he says, he cries out and he says, Whoever believes in me does not believe in me only, but he believes in the one who sent me. He believes in God, the Father, God the Creator, God the Sovereign One. The one who looks at me is seeing the one who sent me. I have come into the world as light. Why do you think He compares us to light? Why does He say it's our eyes that aren't healthy? Because there's no problem with the light. It's a problem with us, not a problem with God. I have come into the world as light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. We should come out of the light. If anyone hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge that person. For I did not come to judge the world but to save the world. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. The very words I have spoken will condemn them on that last day. What are Jesus' words? If you love me, keep my commands. For I did not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. Jesus obeyed the Father just like we're supposed to obey the Father, and Jesus' commands, because they're one and the same. Verse 50, I know that His command leads to eternal life. And so many other wonderful things. Peace that surpasses all understanding. Joy like you could never imagine. And in this world, and in the world to come forever. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. John 13, verse 1. It was just before the Passover festival, and Jesus knew His hour had come. If you read in Scripture before this, Jesus says, I I'm not ready to do this. My hour hasn't come yet. But He says now, hello, listen up. It's time. Those predictions I gave you about my coming death, all this that I've been t talking about and coming forward to, even though you don't understand it, the time has come. In John 2, 4, He said, Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. That started Jesus' ministry. Mary, his mother, provoking him at the wedding in Cana. And he said, My time has not come. But yet he performed mer wonderful miracles there because there was a time of rejoicing. The wedding feast was starting already because the Messiah, the Son of God, had come to a world that had been longing for him to see him but rejected him because they didn't want to believe his words. In John 7, verse 6, Jesus says, My time is not yet here. For you, any time will do. This is Jesus' response when the disciples wanted him to go to Jerusalem to the Feast of the Tabernacles. But guess what? He still went, didn't he? It's in His timing. It's in God's plan. If it takes two years of your light shining to witness to somebody before they come to Christ, or 38 years, your light should still shine. But now Jesus' time has come. So we read in John 13, and we'll start there again, verse 1. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for Him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved His own, those that belonged to Him, that no one can take out of His hand, who were in the world, He loved them to the end. <clears throat> to the very end. To the end of the end that we don't understand. 
to the end and it's the beginning because Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is our brother. God is our Father. We are bought back and ransomed at the price of His blood. We are His own. Verse 2, The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to, to, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under His power, and that He had come from God and was returning to God. So what did He do? So ties that together. He knew who He was. He had no, no doubt. He wasn't just a man. He was God's Son, sent here on earth to accomplish what He accomplished on the cross. Knowing all this, so he got up from the mill, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. He presented himself to his disciples as a servant, a slave, someone who had no rights of their own, who only did the will and the bidding of their master. That's how Jesus addressed, dressed his attire. They fully understood that. He took a manner of a servant slave. Matthew 20, 28 said, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give His life up as a ransom for many. This is the example that Jesus is setting. Verse 5 says, After that, He didn't just stop there. He went on to show them by doing. He poured water into a basin and began to wash His disciples' feet, drying them with a the towel that was wrapped around Him. I said it before, but that was something that none of them would have been willing to do. It's not in Scripture this way, but I guarantee you that if Jesus said, Hey, John, will you go wash their feet? He would say, Me? Why? Because we would think it's below us. We wouldn't have understood any of the teachings that Jesus had taught already. Why do I know that with so much confidence? Because they argued about who would be greatest right after this, right? They didn't get the point. They didn't get it at all. So he set him forth an example in verse 6. He came to Simon Peter, who's going to put his foot in his mouth probably, right? Because he's good about shouting it out, but his heart is, is good. That's why the church is going to be built on that rock after Christ as the chief cornerstone. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, <laughs> are you going to wash my feet? I don't think so, right? You're not getting down there. I know who you are. You're not washing my feet. I do understand we don't need this lesson I know you're God, and because you are, you're not washing my feet. Well, he's kind of missing the point, isn't he? Because Jesus is showing them, if I can humble myself this far, and you're my disciple, <laughs> what are you doing? Right? Are you going to follow after me? Jesus replied, you don't realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. The Son of God, laying as a servant at the feet of of the people that He created that are like us creating ants, but He loved them so much that He said, I'm going to do this for you. I, I think about the ant, and I know that's not even remotely in comparison to us to God, but I think about if I created an ant and everything, and I was amused by them, I loved them, whatever it was, but then my son went out to play, and he got bit all by those ants, what would you go do? You'd burn that ant pile down, wouldn't you? You'd obliterate it. But what did Jesus do? He said, I sent him for that very reason, so that he would die for your sins, so that you could come back into a right relationship with me. Mm. Verse 8, Peter said, No, you shall never wash my feet. But Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. So what does that mean? We're clean. Jesus goes on to say that. But see, we have to walk with Jesus. And when we walk through the filth of this world, we have to rely on Him daily to cleanse us back, to make us prepared for that journey, that we are no better than the Master. We are already clean. We're already justified. We're already children of God. But we're called to walk that walk that the disciples are called to walk. Peter didn't understand this. But that's what Jesus was trying to tell him. If you don't follow after me, you really don't have any part of me. Your feet are going to get dirty. You're going to do things that you don't want to do. I gave you an example of... Well, I didn't give you the example. I told you what we did yesterday. 
Well, coming home, my truck says, and I've got to love all these nice, new, fancy things. It started beeping at me and gave me this message on the board, on the screen right there. Where you drive, pull over as quickly and rationally. I don't know what it said, but it had to throw that in there too. As you can. Okay. I give it some gas instead because I'm going against that truck. It doesn't do anything. Well, guess what? I better give a signal and flashers and pull over because this truck has told me that it's going to shut down, and it did. So I pulled over to the side of the road, and when it hit three mile an hour, it had no, it, re, it governed back the throttle. When it hit three mile an hour, I read in the book, it cut, shut completely off. It would not restart. It wouldn't do anything. So we're on the side of the road, and I called Debbie, and she wasn't willing to pick me up. She said, I'm staying in Coeur d'Alene. <laughs> I called Mark. Thank you, Mark. I love you. He said, I'm in my recliner. <laughs> so I called Jacob to come get us. But the person that came on the rollback had enough room for us to drive in there, but, but we didn't know that. But here's your, what I'm getting at as far as you can witness. We had went down with Henry and Verna Yoder, and, and I was outside with him. He said, are they Amish? I said, they're Amish Christian. And he didn't say anything back. And I said, I said, what's your familiarity? He said, I grew up in Indiana. I'm real familiar with Amish stuff. I said, oh, well, you'll have plenty to talk about with Henry then when he rides back with you because he's Amish Christian. What's your faith? And we talked about the movie we just did, and he said he's Christian, and he got to hear Henry witness to him all the way home. That's the opportunity that we were given when I didn't want to be on the side of that road. I wanted to get on home. We went to the early movies so we could get back in time. And then God has to humble us and teach us that much more. When we finally get home, we're sitting there in the driveway, and I get out and thank Jacob for taking us home. I said, you know what? My house keys are in, the, in that truck that we just left at Rockstad Ford. <laughs> so by the time we got home, got the bulletin printed and everything, it was 1.30 or 2. So if I say anything or look silly, that's why. But I'm running on spirit instead of anything else. But we're given those examples and those opportunities all day long to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And sometimes it means getting a little dirty. Sherry even said afterwards, she said, do you realize what you did doing all that? I was like, no, what? I was talking to the guy on the AAA phone. Thank goodness for AAA there. And I opened the door to get out to check the tire size because they want to send the appropriate vehicle to pick you up. And there's a man standing there. We don't know where he came from <laughs> or anything else. And she's like, you just walked out and said hey to him and thanked him for stopping and stuff. She said, I locked the door. <laughs> I didn't know if he had a gun, anything else. We don't know where he, he was behind us. We never saw him come up. He stopped just to check on us, and I told him we were in good shape. But I had no idea, no fear whatsoever. Call it whatever you want to. I call it peace that surpasses all understanding because I didn't have any understanding that someone could knock me in the head. I was out there just checking my tire size. Call she calls it naive. I call it faith. <laughs> so Jesus is saying, you've got to walk with me. You've got to be fully clean. You've got to walk as I walked and I've commanded. 1 Corinthians 6, 11 says, And that is what some of you were. You were unsaved sinners heading for hell, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were made holy. It's a process, but you are sons of God. You've been completely justified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Like I said, both are interceding to the Father that you are His child. But we're supposed to walk the walk. John 15, 3 says, You were already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. But Jesus is saying here, unless you walk with me, you don't really have any part of me. Unless you're going to follow after me, like I said when you first joined on to this, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Then you really don't have any part of me. Verse 11, For he knew, what he, for he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said, to every, said that not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you, he asked? You call me, what? You call me this, teacher and Lord. And rightly so, because that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. Humble, dedicated, heartfelt service. <clears throat> I 
Verse 16, For very truly I tell you, if you miss what I just said, no servant is greater than his master. He gives each of the examples that we set ourselves up for in our relationship with him. Nor is a messenger, ah, we can't say we're not messengers called to, to do that, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent each and every one of us. Verse 17, Now that you know these things, you will be not forgiven, not okay, but blessed. Blessed by God Almighty when you do them. God has a purpose in relating to us as a father. Because a father who is a good father wants to do anything and everything that they can do for their son because they love, he loves their son so much. How much more blessed things and how much more resources does he have available and everything else does God the Father want to give to his children? It's amazing, but it's true. Jesus has told us right here. So if you read on and you finally get to verse 34 and 35, he says, A new command I have given you, and it's not new, but it is new in what he just said and did. He showed that example. You may have understood this before, but now I'm showing you how to bring this new commandment to life. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. That's what it boils down to. That's the two examples that I gave you. Love is what changed and softened their heart. What made God real to them. All the evidence in the world can't make me believe something I don't want to believe. But when someone continues to love me, even when I'm mean to them, there's a good chance it might soften me up a little bit and then I might see the light that was there in front of me the whole time. One of the sad things about what I saw from the movie is for two years, Lee was obsessed with chasing after this. It was two years that he didn't get to enjoy his little daughter growing up. He missed the birth of his son because he was out investigating. Just think of the blessings if he would obey God. The movie that we saw last Friday night was an investigative reporter. It was similar. And he lost his job, or he had to retire early because of a shooting. And he went in to be a teacher, teacher of criminal justice, and a teacher as far as the baseball coach. And at the end of the movie, he says, if I would have only done what God had planned all along, because he saw the blessing that he got from being the coach to these kids, to telling them. And he didn't even know if he believed it himself. But when he investigated, he got on his knees. And what he saw was his impact on these children and what life that God had in store for him if he would have simply came and followed after Jesus all along. We only have one life. It's only X amount of minutes, days, years, however you want to do it. So don't waste your life. Live it the way Jesus intended for you to live it. He died for that very reason. So, oh Christian, do you understand this? Will you humble yourself and be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God? Will you do that? Father, we thank you so much that Jesus came into Jerusalem because he knew it was his time. That he taught his disciples. That he said, not my will, but thine, Father. And that as he was dying, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. His words are clear. His example is clear. Let us be obedient. And Father, when we fail, give us the power of the Spirit. When we're distracted, give us the power of the Spirit. When we doubt, give us the power of the Spirit. Lead us and guide us. We thank you and praise you. May we truly realize that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.